Hey, good morning, and uh, welcome to another edition of Park at Home, a video worship experience. Uh, wherever you're tuning in from, whether this is the first time you've ever watched one of these videos or the tenth time, we're very grateful that you are joining us. Here at Park Church, we follow Jesus. We believe that he is the hope of the world. We believe that he is Savior. We, we believe that he is full of grace and truth, and that if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. And we believe that he invites everyone, including you, into a life-giving, life-saving relationship with himself. And it's because we follow Jesus that we, we uh, have partnerships with organizations like Habcor. Now, if, if you've been tuning in, you may know that, that, that we, we have this relationship with a local organization called Habcor, which, which is an organization we appreciate very much because what they do is they exist to help serve and provide resources for individuals and families who do not have permanent homes. And, and so one of the resources they provide is temporary housing. And so last weekend, a group of people from Park Church went to one of these houses and they, they worked very hard on beautifying it. They, they picked weeds, they power washed, they planted, they painted, they worked on a picnic table. There are a lot of peas going on here. And, and they did this because they followed Jesus. And so if you were one of those folks who went and did that, I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking time to go and, and do this. Uh, one, one other announcement this morning. For the month of July, we've been, we've been going through a weekly Zoom series every Wednesday night at 8.30 called Let's Start a Conversation, which, which is a conversation around race, justice, and the gospel of Jesus. In it, we have had the most richest of conversations. Uh, I'm so grateful to all of the guests that we've had, as well as all of you who have been participating. Well, this next week, we're going to have our final Zoom session of Let's Start a Conversation, but I hope it's not the end of the conversation. Uh, if, if you've missed them, and, or let's say you've missed some of them, we have all of the recordings online. Just go to our website or our YouTube page and you can watch all of the recordings so far. And, and even if you haven't made any of the sessions before, you're more than welcome to jump on this next week and join us for, for this week's final session. Now, in a moment, we are going to sing a song together. And, and there's a line in this song that, that calls us to, invites us to sing to the Lord, to sing to God, because of his love for us. And so at this point, I wanna, I wanna invite you to join us in song, to join us in song singing praises to the God who loves us so much. Come, happy souls, come to your God.
sinners come and heal your wounds. Come wipe your sorrows dry. Come and trust the mighty Savior's name. Hi, my name is Corinne, and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Father God, we are living in such wild and unprecedented and unnerving times. Uncertainty lingers over us like a cloud. Anxiety abounds. Deep fears have been tapped and stirred in everyone's hearts, causing many things to rise up from the depths. Some beautiful things and some very ugly things, Lord. We have become a distrustful and divided people. We assume the worst instead of the best. We approach all people and circumstances with guards up. And Father, you've called us to be your church in such a time as this. Father, we ask you to help us to be the de-escalators, the listening ears, the glimpse of light in the darkness. We ask you to give us compassion for those who have neglected to show compassion to others. Help us to see what you see in them, your scared child grasping for certainty in uncertain times. Help us to speak truth, but to do so in love. Give us a posture of humility as we all navigate uncharted waters together as a community. Help us to be a loving support to our teachers, our children, our parents, our, profession, our medical professionals, and all those who are in high stress situations. Lord, remind us that we all respond to stress differently. Help us to have grace for those who experience stress differently than us. Grant those in power mighty wisdom and humility as they make very big decisions that impact all of us. Grant us wisdom to respond to those decisions and their impacts wisely. Lord, please protect those who are especially vulnerable, not just physically, but economically. Father, please provide your security and shelter and stability and give us eyes to see how we can be your hands and feet in doing so as well. Help us to love our neighbors through discomfort and through inconvenience to ourselves. As we battle our own anxiety and uncertainty, Lord, remind us that you are the same God you always were, ever present, ever faithful, and ever in control. Lord, this virus is big and it is scary. Remind us that you are bigger. You are bigger than the brokenness. You are bigger than the rising numbers. 
You are bigger than the hate. You are bigger than the uncertainty of the fall, and you are bigger than the upcoming election. There is no divide too big for your love to bridge. Help us to face the uncertainty with the certainty that you are still God, and you are still good, and you have not left us, and you are still working. In your name, amen. Good morning, and welcome again to today's Park at Home video worship experience. We're glad that you've joined us. My name is Matt, and I am a pastor here on staff at Park, and it's my privilege this morning to wrap up the uh, series that we're going through this July, Cross the Divide, Following Jesus in a Divided World. And today, I'm going to wrap up this series with another practice that we can do. But to be honest with you, I have a personal problem with it. I have a personal issue with it. Have you ever had a, a, a friend or maybe even your kid come to you with a problem or with some issue that they're facing and you listen to it and you hear what they have to say and you can see what the problem is. You can see uh, what the issue is. You can see what their solution is. And just as you're about to give the advice that would help fix the problem, you have a hard time actually giving the advice because you realize even though it's very good advice, it's advice that you yourself don't follow, right? It's advice that, you know, um, you don't practice what you would be preaching and so you're hesitant to give it. That's me this morning. What I have to share with you could be something that really does change your life, and it could be something that changes the lives around you, and it could be something that absolutely changes the world. And yet, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm just not very good at doing it. I'm not very good at practicing what I will be preaching. And so the only way I can actually share this with you is um, under the agreement that I'm talking to you as much as I'm, I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to you, because when I point one finger at you, remember, I'm pointing three fingers at myself. Um, and I need to work on this as much as probably more than you do. And as a, as a way of wrapping it up, um, I kind of want to uh, just give it to you right up front. And here's, here's the main point. Uh, how can we be people who cross the divide? if we ourselves are not willing to cross the divide. And here's what I mean by that. How can we be people who cross the divide, who follow Jesus across the divide, if we're not in relationships with people who are on the other side of the divide? And this is obvious and this is practical, but just take last week, for instance, how can we possibly be people who follow Jesus across the divide by listening to others if we're not in relationship with those people? And the obvious answer is that we can't. And uh, this is something that Jesus knew very well. When you read the Gospels, the story of his life and his ministry, you saw him again and again crossing the divide and forming relationships with people on the other side of the, of the divide. He knew this so well that he actually put this principle, put this idea into some of the stories that he told, uh, and especially a famous parable that he told. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to dig into this famous parable um, because it illuminates how we can actually cross that divide and what the character of the relationships are that we're supposed to form across the divide. And this is a parable. This is a story that Jesus told that I am guilty. I am guilty of speaking about this parable entirely too much, if that is possible. If you've been around Park for a while, you know I speak about this parable more than anything else, and it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, you might know it, you probably have heard about it, but here's a little bit of kind of the context of the story. This is uh, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Jesus is, you know, in a room talking to, teaching a bunch of people, and all of a sudden, a lawyer stands up. And this is a Jewish lawyer, not the kind of lawyer that we think of. This is someone who is an expert in the Jewish, in the Jewish law, an expert in the Jewish scriptures. He stands up and uh, he asks Jesus, teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do? And Jesus replies to him, you know, you're the lawyer, you tell us. And he says, okay, well, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and mind and, and, and strength and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
And Jesus replies, that's right, you nailed it. Go and do that. But the lawyer, uh, Luke says, wanting to justify himself, which in this case means um, he wants to make sure he's in the right. Specifically, he wants to make sure that he doesn't have to love people he doesn't want to love. The lawyer asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Uh, And Jesus, I imagine he kind of steps back and he's like, I'm glad you asked. And then he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And here's how it begins. Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So imagine the scene for a second. It's a long road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's downhill. It's um, wilderness. This is a dangerous path. The sort of thing that happened was a common thing where robbers would come, right? And so this man is walking all by himself, and along comes this band of robbers, and they beat him up. They strip him of all of his stuff. They strip him of all of his clothes, and they leave him half dead on the side of the road. Um, they take advantage of him because they're in a position that is more powerful and they're planned and they can do this to him. They can overwhelm him with their power and with their might. If you think about it for a second, what they're actually doing to this man is they are marginalizing him. Um, the margins on paper is, this, is you know, the part on the side. What they are doing is they are marginalizing him. They are beating him up, taking advantage of him, and pushing him off to the side of the road, leaving him half dead. And I use this word marginalized because I think it, um, it's especially important given the context that we live in today. As we have found out, especially through um, the Black Lives Matter movement over the last few months, but really over the last few years and hundreds of years, there are people in this country who have become marginalized. That's their experience. And though it's not a perfect one-for-one correspondence with this parable, there is a lot of correspondence. Um, This man has been victimized. He has been taken advantage of by people more powerful than he is. He has been in, um, in some way pushed down oppressed, discarded, uh, marginalized. That's this man's experience. And then, uh, as Jesus says, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so imagine this scene. There's a man laying there half dead, gasping for air on the side of the road. And along comes a priest, a priest in Those days, um, these were people of the highest echelon of society. They had the position, right? They had the power. They had the status. They were the privileged part of society. And he sees the man, right? He sees him, and he, he, he just keeps on going. Now, why does he do this? Probably because for a priest, um, if he were to go over to the man and help him, he would he would get himself dirty, right? I mean, he would physically get himself dirty and touching a man who was all beaten up and bloodied and maybe even half dead, um, this would make him impure, ritually unclean. And for the priest to be unclean would mean that he would have to go through purification rites that would take days, maybe even weeks. And so his job would be, you know, greatly inconvenienced by this. And so the priest, he sees this man, he does the mental calculation, what it will cost him, and he decides to keep on going. When it comes down to it, he has the privilege and the freedom to keep on going because his life is unaffected by this man's pain. Jesus continues, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. A Levite is sort of just like a priest. When he comes, it's the same story. He sees the man, he does the calculation about what it would cost, and then he decides to keep on going because his life is unaffected by this man's pain. Then Jesus says, But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. Now, Samaritans in that culture, um, these were people whom everyone else in the room that Jesus was talking to, with the exception of Jesus, 
uh, everyone else would have discriminated against Samaritans. Everyone in the room was Jewish, right? The lawyer who asked the question was Jewish. Uh, everyone else who's sitting there listening is all Jewish. Uh, the, the, the priest and the Levite in the story are Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. All of his disciples, his followers, they're all Jewish. This is a Jewish parable in a Jewish context. Um, and in those days, uh, Jewish f- folks would have discriminated against Samaritans. They were kind of second-class citizens. They were knockoff Jewish people. They were from a different part of um, the land. They were from up north, kind of like the woods, the, the, the sticks. They were kind of looked down upon because they didn't actually worship in the right place. They didn't worship in Jerusalem. They were ethnically and geographically discriminated against, which, when it comes down to it, is really just a form of racism. Interesting note, uh, in the previous chapter, chapter 9, there's a story where Jesus and his followers are going through a Samaritan village, and they're doing what they did. They were preaching the gospel, the good news that Jesus has come, that God was visiting them in Jesus. And the Samaritans, what do they do? They don't really care. They, They reject them. They're like, no, 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 we're okay. We don't need Jesus. And Jesus' followers, what do they do? They ask Jesus, what do you want us to do about this? Do you want us to rain down fire upon them and destroy them? Certainly no love loss between uh, these Jewish followers of Jesus and the Samaritans. Jesus is like, no, 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 let's, let's, let's pump the brakes on that. Talk about a group of people who were on the other side of the divide, who were ethnically, geographically, racially discriminated against. Um, it's interesting, of course, that Jesus inserts racial tension, right? Discrimination into this very simple question, who is my neighbor? It's very instructive to what Jesus wants us to see from this. So Jesus says the Samaritan came near him and when he saw him. Now I just want to pause for a moment. When Jesus says, and when he saw him, these are the same exact words that Jesus said of the priest. And when he, the priest, saw him, He passed by on the other side. The same exact words that he uses of the Levite. And when he, the Levite, saw him, he passed by on the other side. But when the Samaritan man saw him, when he saw him, he was moved with pity. And this word pity, this is not the word that we we think of when we think of the word pity. This is a word that means um, passionate love. This is a word that means compassion. The kind of compassion that wells up from deep within us when we see someone else in pain. Have you ever had the experience of seeing someone else in pain or seeing some injustice happening and your guts inside of you just twist and turn? That's what this compassion is. This is a compassion, listen, that moves us to action. This is a word, especially in the Gospel of Luke, that is used very carefully and very intentionally. This is a compassion that when Jesus sees a widow who has already lost her husband and now has also lost her son, her only son, she has lost everything. He sees her in her grief and he is so moved with compassion that he goes to her and he raises her son to new life. That's the sort of compassion. This is the compassion that when Jesus sees the crowds like sheep without a shepherd, it moves him to feed them. This is the compassion that the father feels in the parable of the prodigal son. When he sees his son who is lost, who is ragged, who he thought was dead, When he sees him coming, he is so overwhelmed with compassion welling up from within him that it causes him to run towards his son and embrace him again. This is the compassion, listen, that God feels when he looks at this broken and lost and dead world and sent his son in it to save it. This is the compassion that drove Jesus to the cross. It's a compassion that absolutely and uh, from within, it moves us to action. This is the sort of compassion, listen, that simply doesn't allow us to see someone in pain. And like the priest and the Levite, to keep on going with our lives unaffected by it. 
This is what he experiences. Jesus continues. He says, He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. You see what he does? He, he's riding on a donkey, and he goes right over to the man. And he, he gets off the donkey, he gets down onto his hands and his knees, and he serves this man. He takes out what he has, his oil and his wine, and he cleans, the, he cleans the wounds of this man. He takes out the bandages that he has, and he bandages up his wounds. I imagine that he takes his tunic off, and he wraps the man in his tunic to avoid him getting shock, and he picks up the man, and he puts him onto his donkey and he walks the donkey into town and there's no medical clinics there's no hospitals there so he finds an inn that has a room uh, and he you know he pays for this man to stay there to be taken care of uh, until he is nursed back to full health Uh, this Samaritan man will pay for everything he uses what he has in order to serve and to help and to restore this man who has been victimized, who has been beaten up, who has been taken advantage of, who has been left half dead. And then Jesus looks that lawyer right in the eyes. He says to him, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The question that Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Which of these three was a neighbor? Do you hear what is behind that question? There's a statement. There's an idea behind that question. And here it is. That each of us, that lawyer, Every person in the room, you, me, each of us have a decision before us at all times, whether to make ourselves a neighbor to the person who is beat up, who is victimized, who is marginalized, or not. Each of us have a decision to make, whether to keep going to turn our face to what's happening over here, to ignore it because we can, or to make ourselves a neighbor by going to that person and lifting them up and serving them and using what we have to restore them. That same decision was before each person in this parable. The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, and the only person who took it was the Samaritan. The point that Jesus is bringing out of this story, and I want you to hear it as clear as day, and here it is. The point is, choose to make yourself a neighbor to the person who is in need. And for our context today, especially within this series, choose to make yourself a neighbor to the person who is on the other side of the divide. Choose to make yourself a neighbor. And though this is true for any divide, and it's true for anyone in need, um, I think it's worth today focusing in a little bit on race. And I do this in part because of the context that we're in, but I also do this in part because it's worth reiterating that Jesus is the one who inserted race into this story. Remember, he doesn't need to put the Samaritan in the story. This could have been a Jewish parable about Jewish people, right? Or it could have been a totally generic parable, just about people in general. But he doesn't. He specifically makes this about race, about discrimination, because he could see in the eyes of the people who are listening. He could see in the eyes of the lawyer. Evidently, he could see... uh, in the hearts of his disciples, that racial discrimination was something that he needed to deal with, and he did it in part through this parable. Him telling this parable in that context, this is what it would have been like. It would have been like a white preacher 
in the Jim Crow South, speaking to a white congregation of people who were white people in those days, which were pretty much all white supremacists, right? Speaking to them about how they are not living up to uh, the way of life that God has called them to live, and then making up a story that lifts up a black man as not only an example of um, what you should live like, of what life ought to look like, but lifting him up as an example of what God is actually like. And then turning to those same white people and saying, be like the black man. This is what it was like for Jesus to tell this parable in that context. And so if it can speak to them then, it ought to be able to speak to us today for our context, especially with regards to racial division. And here's here's the reality of this. And I'll be totally honest with you. We are set up in this culture, in our area, in our county, to be good neighbors across the racial divide. We are. There's no reason why we can't be. We are set up for that. However, we as individuals, we are so much more likely and so much more tempted because it is so much easier to play the part of the priest and the Levite. To play that part. It's true. It's so much easier because it doesn't cost us anything. Take me, for instance. I grew up as a upper middle class white male in a predominantly white town. And yeah, I moved away for a little bit, uh, but I moved back to that predominantly white town. That's, that's sort of the world that I live in. I have, the, I have the freedom. I have the resources. I have the power. I have the ability. I have the privilege of seeing and, and hearing the cries from the black community about systemic racism. I have the power and the freedom and the privilege to hear those cries and to keep on going because my life is unaffected by it. This kind of came to a head for me a few weeks ago. I was at, I was at a vigil uh, in my town, uh, and it was a vigil to remember the victims of racial violence. And there was, there was a councilman from Red Bank. He was an African-American gentleman who spoke at this vigil. And he spoke for a little while, and then um, he listed off you know, all of these names of people who have been the victims of racial violence over the last few decades. And it was, it was moving to hear. It really was. And then he did something that was unexpected. He reenacted the last dying words of George Floyd. And he did it with, with passion and with fire. And it was absolutely moving. I've never watched that video. I've never watched that tape. And it's not because I, I can't take it. It's because I've never, I never needed to. But I listened to this man uh, on that day reenact what George Floyd's last words were. Help me. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. Help me. I, I can't breathe. And listening to him say this with just such such passion. It was moving. I had to fight back tear. It struck me, and I think it struck most people who were there. And then after that, we had a, a moment of silence, but it wasn't just a moment of silence. It was, it was eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence. And that was the amount of time that um, the knee was on the neck of George Floyd before he died. And so there we are on this, on this hot, sunny afternoon in this field with absolutely no shade, standing there with our masks on, right? It's COVID, with our masks on for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I'm standing there, and I could feel it from everyone else that eight minutes and 46 seconds of standing in silence is a long time. And we're all getting a little droopy in the knees, we're all getting a little tired, and You can feel people starting to get fidgety. And I start thinking to myself, gosh, this is really uncomfortable. This is, it's it's hard to breathe in this mask. And I stop myself from thinking to myself, I can't breathe because the irony of 
standing relatively comfortable in a field for eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, compared to George Floyd's uncomfortableness would have just been too much to bear. And so I'm trying to push past my uncomfortableness and I'm trying to think about, gosh, what would it have been like if that was my son who had that knee on his neck? I have three boys. What would it have been like? I don't have a brother, but what would it have been like if it were my brother? What would it have been like if it were my dad or one of my best friends? What would it have been like if it were me? And as I was thinking about it, I thought to myself, I realized I can't think about that. I can't imagine that. Because I grew up as an upper middle class white guy where that scenario simply will not happen to me. Because I have the freedom and the resources and the privilege of that not happening. So I can avoid listening, watching that tape. I can hear the cries of the black community and keep on going with my life absolutely unaffected by it. But here's the problem. The reason that Jesus told this parable was to speak to people like me who want to be his followers and who are much more likely to act like the priest and the Levite. He spoke this parable to people like me and maybe to people like you at home to say to us in clear terms, don't be like that. Be like the Samaritan. Make yourself a neighbor to those who are in need, who have been taken advantage of, who have been marginalized, who have been victimized. When you think about what it means to be a neighbor in the way that Jesus is talking about it, it means not to ignore it, but to go to that person. It means to get down on your hands and your knees, and it means um, to take out what you have. In the story, it was oil and wine and bandages and time and money and resources. What it means for us is to go to that person and use what we have in order to lift them up in order to serve them, in order to come alongside them and be with them. Remember, in the Samaritan story, the Samaritan, he's not like a savior. Like, this is not a white savior issue. The Samaritan comes, he gets off his, his donkey, he gets onto the ground. He's in solidarity with this person. He lifts him up, puts him on his donkey. He switches places with him. That's what, that's what we're called to do, to come alongside people who are on the other side of the divide and who are suffering and come under them and, and serve them and help them, help be part of their restoration. To borrow a phrase from another uh, thing that Jesus said, what it means to make yourself a neighbor, turns out it means to lay your life down for that person. That's what the Samaritan is doing. He's laying his life down for the sake of that person. Now, you at home, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, I get it. I really do. <clears throat> I get what he's talking about. Um, but here's the problem. I don't actually see people who were beat up and left for dead on the side of the road on my jogging route. That's not, that's not what I see. And I get he's talking about like systemic racism, right? But like, what am I supposed to do as one single person? I hate racism too. I'm against it. But this is a problem that's been going on for hundreds of years, um, for thousands of years. This parable was told 2,000 years ago, and it was a problem then. It's a problem today. This big macro problem, how am I, as one individual, supposed to actually make a difference? How am I supposed to actually help this? And if that's the question you're asking, it's a great question. And I want to give you a very simple answer to that question. And it's actually based off of another time where Jesus talks about what it means to lay down your life for someone, just like the Samaritan lays down his life. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to his <clears throat> followers. And what he says to them is, there is no greater love than laying your life down for your friends. Jesus uses that word, your friends. There's no greater love than laying your life down for your friends. And so for us today, the concept of making ourselves a neighbor to someone on the other side of the divide might be a little hard to hold on to. I understand that. 
but the concept of making yourself a friend to someone on the other side of the divide, that should be something that you can get and connect with immediately. And so the challenge from this parable for us today in our context, here it is. Form friendships with people who are on the other side of the divide. Think to yourself for a second, and I've I thought about this. I'm kind of ashamed. How many friends do you have? Uh, like real friends, not people you work with, not acquaintances. <clears throat> I'm talking about friends who you're inviting over for dinner, uh, who you're asking for a ride to the airport, who, you, who you know, you're having your wedding party. How many friends do you have who, who look different than you? If you're a Republican, how many friends do you have who are Democrats? Or if, you're, if you're liberal, how many friends do you have who are conservative? How many friends do you have that are of a different socioeconomic class than you? If you were born in this country, how many friends do you have who were born somewhere else and maybe are even here undocumented? And the question of the day, of course, is uh, if you're white, how many people are you friends with who aren't white, who are black, who, who look different than you? Make no mistake about it, being friends with people on the other side of the divide is not by itself going to fix systemic racism. For that to happen, there needs to be policy change, there needs to be real societal change. I understand that. But what happens when we do become friends with people on the other side of the divide is we do get one or two or three steps closer to that goal. Because what happens when you're friends with someone on the other side of the divide, is that they stop becoming those people and they become a person. Because when you're friends with someone, you know them, you know their story, you know what makes them tick, you know their dreams, you know their pain. And when they're mistreated, it's not just a them over there, it's not just an it who is being mistreated, but it's your friend who's being mistreated. And then their cause becomes your cause. That's the way it works. When we're friends with people on the other side of the divide, it disallows us from walking down that road and turning our face away unaffected because our lives aren't impacted by this, because our lives are impacted by that, because our friends are impacted by that. The challenge for you today and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to tell you this is easy or it's a one, two, three step process or just go out and find a friend who's different than you tomorrow and all will be solved. I, I won't say that. But the challenge for you is to move towards making friends, real friends with people who are different than you, who are on the other side of the divide. And if you were to do that, and if I were to do that, and if we were to do that together as a community, what would happen? What could happen? We would change a lot and we would grow. We would grow to become more Christ-like. We would grow to become more human. What would happen is that we would end up looking a lot less like ourselves and more like the kingdom of God that Jesus brings on earth as it is in heaven. And you know what else would happen? If you made that change, that little change in your life would actually be a big change in your life because the people around you would see that you love and care about people who are on the other side of the divide and your kids would see that and they would know that that's something that's valuable and then maybe at school they would love differently and their friends would see that and their school would see that and who knows what would be impact and, and then you go to work and your friends with people on the other side of the divide at work and the people who you work with see that. And they go home and their families are different or their industry is different because of that. That change in our lives would send ripple effects out. That could actually change our area. That could actually change our county, maybe change our state. Maybe it could change the world. Imagine for a second if every Jesus follower across the globe actually took this parable seriously as a call to racial reconciliation, as a call to go across the divide and form friends, form friendships with people there. Imagine what would happen. The world would change. The world would be totally different. But here's the thing. You can't change the world. You can't change what they do over there. 
You can't change what the person who you're sitting next to right now does. The only person who you can change is you. So make that change. Follow Jesus across the divide. Make yourself a neighbor to the person on the other side of the divide. Form friendships with people who are different than you. That's the call that Jesus is giving us through this parable today. That's how we can follow him across the divide. Let's pray. Father, first off, thank you for being the God who crossed the greatest divide. When you came to us as one of us in order to save us, in order to pick us up out of our being half dead, out of our darkness, out of our sin, and, and picking us up and carrying us and forgiving us and paying to restore us. Father, we thank you for crossing that divide. God, we ask you for forgiveness. We confess to you the ways that we have been more like the priest and the Levite and have turned our faces away and turns our, turned our backs on our brothers and sisters as they are being beaten up, as they're being taken advantage of, as, as they're being oppressed, as they're being choked to death. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we, that I have been a part of that, Lord, forgive us. For the ways that we have neglected to rise to this call, to this important conversation sooner, Lord, forgive us as a church. Going forward, Lord, help us to be mindful of these issues. Help us to take them with the same amount of seriousness that you did and that you do today. Lord, make it so that our collective hearts are broken so that that compassion wells up within us and moves us to action when we see our brothers and sisters who are being marginalized. Father, we pray that you would help us as individuals be moved to form friendships with people who are on the other side of the divide, to make ourselves a neighbor to people who are on the other side of the divide, to people who are different than us. Lord, give us the courage to do that. Father, as Michael preached about a few weeks ago, give us the humility that we need. And as last week, help us to listen, Lord, and help us to do it under the power of your gospel, the good news of your cross and your resurrection. Send us in the power of your spirit to do that. To those of us who can't see the people who are on the other side of that divide, who are in our lives already, Lord, we pray that you would just make that clear to us. Open our eyes to what we can't see now. And Lord, help us to see the people who are on the other side of the divide, who are in our lives. Help us Help us to see them and go to them. Well up within us that same compassion that the Samaritan felt. Lord, we know that we cannot change the world. We can only change ourselves. And we pray that through us, you would continue to transform us and to transform this community, to transform our county, to transform our state, and then the world. But we entrust it into you to your hands, Lord. Help us to follow you, Jesus, across that divide. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus with thy church abide, be her Savior, Lord and guide. While on earth her faith is tried, we beseech thee, all her fettered powers release, bid our strife and envy cease, grant the heavenly gift of peace, we beseech thee. See
Hey, once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We, we know that, that people tune in to our Park at Home video worship experience, not just on Sunday mornings, but all throughout the week. And also not just here locally, but all throughout the country and, and even outside of the country. So whenever you're tuning in from wherever, uh, we are so glad to have you and we hope to see you again. And, and let me also just say that uh, we, we are consistently grateful for those of you who faithfully give to fund the mission here at Park Church. The reason why we're able to do what we do is because God works through your generosity to make many of these things happen. And so I just wanna say thank you. Thank you and please, as you feel led, uh, continue to help fund the mission here at Park Church. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Matt for the benediction. I wanna close with this good word from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, and together all of God's people said, Amen. <laughs>